So Bess, um, excited to spend some time with you. Um, so you are the first person ever to be on case studies, which I, I hope you take as like such a sincere compliment. You know, first person I thought about when I was thinking about, you know, what I, you know, dream about when I'm thinking about this podcast is diving into the lives of people that I just respect. And you, you fall in that category. We can go into it for like a ton of reasons, but like we've been competitors, um, been friends, been partners on different things and, you know, just kind of had a chance to watch you grow in your career for a lot of years. And so anyway, thank, thanks for coming on. It's a massive honor. Casey, you have put a ton into me uh, over the years and it means a lot to me. I, I've woken up at least a few times with a, with a voice memo or literally a, a video <laughs> from you just expressing gratitude for the relationship you're one of only a few people that have ever done that. So when you call, I definitely uh, no, but, but, but I hope, you know, it, it's sincere. It's, it's not lip service or it's not like a habit or a practice. It's something that, you know, when I think about, you know, what, what inspires me and ultimately the inspiration for this podcast is how do you go document the good stuff? How do you go document the gold? How do you like look at people's lives that are getting results that you admire or you, you, you like and say, what are they doing? What, what are the actual habits and rituals and how do they think different than everybody else? And you just, you've got so many of those, you know, and, and we're going to have time to dive into, into it today, but I, but I wanted to kind of give a quick intro. So Vess, uh, married 38, right? 39, 39. So, so 39 years old, almost hitting the 40, um, married to Angie, four kids. Yes. Um, CEO and founder of Aptive Environmental, um, kind of a leading, um, services company, uh, multiple, multiple services, but predominantly kind of pest control and, um, have just built like a really beautiful business. Um, you know, we can go into the numbers and kind of where you started and where you got to. And, um, but anyway, just kind of a wildly successful entrepreneur, dad, um, you know, member of the community, kind of leader in your church, you know, all, all, all those things that we'll kind of go into. So anyway, honored to have you on. So let, let, let's just dive right in. Go, go back to the beginning. So when you're like 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, what do you want to be when you grow up? When you're when you're thinking, hey, when I grow up, this is what I'm gonna. When I grow up, I'm gonna play on the Angels. I was a massive baseball guy, loved it. Started when I was really young, uh, went through high school. I think by maybe 14 or 15 years old, I realized that oh, okay, I'm a I'm a good baseball player, but yeah, I'm not gonna be a major league baseball player. And this uh, is Southern California, right? Yep, Corona, yeah, so. Corona, I'm sure California. competition was like really good. Really I, good. I assume. Yeah, re really good. I remember my freshman year, I was on varsity. And it, this is kind of an embarrassing highlight, but we were in the quarterfinals of, of, the, of the playoffs. And I never got to play because I was a freshman on varsity, which, which was really cool. Yeah. Um, so it's the, it's the last inning. Somehow, some way, I have to go into second base to play. And a ball's hit up the middle, like time stood still. And I'm like, oh my goodness. It comes to me, touch second base, throw it over the first base. Game is over. Game, game ending double play. And I remember the next day in the newspaper, it said, seldom used Vest Pearson <laughs> ends the game, you know, you know, turning this double play. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool to be in the paper, but seldom used. You got a backhanded kinda, compliment. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I have a turn and two as a freshman. Uh, yeah, that, that was fun. That was you fun. had to have been like, you had to have excelled. I mean, you you don't play. Yeah. You don't play varsity sports as a freshman kind of ever, you know, yeah. at any school. Right. You know, maybe a smaller school, but to go play at a big school in Southern California. Yeah. No, it was, it was a really good run. But I, I quickly realized, okay, that's not going to be where my future is. Um, and I grew up with excellent parents, very disciplined, sacrificed a ton, 
self-taught, um, really great values. Uh, and we were, we were middle class and it was an, it was amazing lifestyle. That said the the nature of my father, you know, he was born to parents that were 17 and 18 years old. Um, and so he had to grow up really, really fast. And as a result of that, I was, he was a bit of a stressor. And although things were always fine, financially speaking, it was always tighter and, and he, he was stressed about money. And that was actually a massive blessing to me because really, really early in life, I decided, man, I, I want to eliminate that pressure from my own life because I saw the, the toll that it put on my, on my dad. And I think that that gave me a focus and a discipline um, to, to try to figure out how to eliminate that stress uh, that, that served me really so well. So this, this is, you know, I have a thesis on this. Did you have models at that age that had it figured out? Did you kind of have a rich dad, poor dad? Did you have kind of, you know, th- those people in your life that you said, I like that. I, I love wh- where we're at, but I don't like this piece of where we're at. You know, was there, you know, I know, I know it's like a young age and you don't have everything kind of put together. But were were the there those people? Yeah, so I, I have an uncle Len who who was uh, an attorney, um, uh, very disciplined, very successful. He was a partner, and I would say that he was one of those those models for me. Where I I saw him, and I thought, man, like I want to do the things that he does. And so at the time, I was for sure going to go to law school. And I talked to him because that's what he did. That's what he did. Yep. I talked to him all the time. Uh, How how did you do it? Where did you go to school? What did you do after school? Uh, Because my, my, my own dad taught me find someone that you admire and go and copy them. If they can do it, you can do it. Yeah. You know, if, if I'm going to drive to Salt Lake, I know all of the turns that I have to take. My job is just to execute the turns and there's a hundred percent certainty I'm going to make it, make it to the Delta center Yeah, because I'm just going to follow the turns. And my dad taught me that, Hey, that same principle you can apply, you know, to almost everything uh, in life, just extreme discipline and taking the right turns. Kind of that principle of modeling. Exactly. Um, from the get go, like, is that something that you're like, you remember him talking to you when you're 10, when you're 15, like when, when is it that it kind of clicked that? I think, I think from an early, from a very early age, find a mentor, copy them, do what they do. Uh, they put their pants on just the same way as you put your pants on. So if they can do it, you can do it type yeah. of principle. And so he, he was a attorney, entrepreneurial attorney on his own. Yep, own his own, his own business. Very, very charitable as well. Gave back a ton, um, which that had you know put an imprint on my heart as well. Uh, he was holding events all of the time, uh, trying to give back to the community, and yeah, he he was just an outstanding role model for me. No, it's cool. I I think about so uh, I had an ex- very similar upbringing seven kids, the most amazing parents, but we, we, we never, we had everything we needed. There was never anything that we didn't need that we didn't have, but there was a lot of wants that we didn't have. You know what I mean? And, and I remember I had a friend, you know, one of my best friends, his dad, very different situation. They own kind of the most prominent business, you know, in the local town that I was from. And I just saw the way that they lived and the way that we lived and there, there was a couple, I, I had this one experience. We, we went to Vegas. I'm 17 years old. And it was me and my buddy as 17 year old. Like we're actually in Mesquite. Me and my buddies are going to go to Vegas for the night. And my buddy's dad's like, you're not going to Vegas. It's 17 year olds. <laughs> and so he's like, if you let me take you to Vegas, I'll, I'll have it be the best night you've ever had. And we're like, deal sounds amazing. And so we go to Vegas. We're, you know, riding roller coasters and we go to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. And I'd never eaten it. Like fine dining for me was Sizzler when I was mine too. When I was seven, which is actually <laughs> we like went really on good. I, I think it was like underrated, you know. But, exactly. But I remember eating a steak at Roos Chris Steakhouse and being like, I had this distinct thought. This is seventeen. I need to make a lot of money so that I can eat at these places for the rest of 
my life. And that's like as, you know, as like simple minded as I was. But I remember experiencing it and just saying like, hey, that I want a life like that. And it feels like the people that I know that are successful, you know, they, they, no one gets there by themselves. You, you have these models or these people that believed in you more than you believed in yourself. And it sounds like your uncle was one of those people. Absolutely. So, so build on that. Who else are those people in your life? Who's the three, who's the five that you say that person believed in me at a time in my life more than I believed in myself and gave me the confidence to go do it, to go for it. Yeah. And an immediate second person is Steve Lund. Uh, Steve Lund was one of the founders of New Skin. Um, he was my mission president, and now he is uh, the young men's general president uh, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Larry Saints. And um, the thing that I loved about Steve um, is I remember being a, a missionary and I, I knew who he was. I, I knew that he was worth a ton. And he would introduce himself uh, out in Atlanta, Georgia as a lotion salesman. And what do you do? Oh, yeah, I, I sold lotion. And, and that was it. Uh, I remember going to his home and just being so impressed um, with the feeling that I had there, uh, the modesty of it. Not that it's not that I don't believe you, you shouldn't have nice things if that's what you want, um, whether that's a plane or a big home or whatever. But his style was they, they remained pretty modest. Um, and he carried his wealth with such humility and dignity. And, and I thought, you know what, if I ever achieve a portion of the success that he has, um, I want, I don't want people to view me as the arrogant rich guy. I want them to see me as Steve Lund. And then on top of that, um, there was no secret that God was most important to him that he understood where his capacity came from, where his capabilities come from. And he walked away from his career when he could have made a whole bunch more money to go and serve. Yo. And I thought, man, like there's a lot going on that I really admire uh, about Steve. And the last thing I will say is in his world, I mean, he's, he's dealing with, um, head of states of countries Yo. and the biggest um, CEOs and entertainers. And, you know, his Rolodex is people like Mitt Romney yet somehow, some way he finds time for Vess Pearson. And he's done that for 15 years. Like, how do you remember to call me <laughs> of all of these people? And so I, uh, when I grew up, I want to be like, well, what was your experience through the mission with him? Kind of walk me, you know, I served a church mission myself, kind of know that, that stage of your being your junior. And then you kind of take a leadership role and kind of go through it. Was there ever a time, you know, so was my, there a time where he like called you out and said, Oh hey, man, you're special or like you can do this or he actually, the, the, the two biggest memories I have with him are times where he, he didn't tell me I'm special. He called me out <laughs> in a massive way. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, so I remember my very first letter as a missionary uh, to him. Um, I'm fired up. I think I know exactly how to do everything. And I am lamenting to him about the people that I'm working with, uh, specifically the congregation. They're not helping us. The leadership isn't very good. And write this really well, I thought articulated letter. And he writes me back one sentence. It, it's one of the most, um, I don't know, maybe it's the most important sentence anyone's ever written to me personally. He says, dear elder Pearson, brow beating doesn't work. Love Steve Lund. I'm like, wow. Whoa. <laughs> That, that that hit me. I even just got the, the chills that, hey, going around trying to beat people across the head and tell them why, telling them why they're wrong is not going to inspire them. It is not going to motivate them. You need to find another way uh, to do that. And, and obviously we could talk about maybe what some of those ways would be, but dear Elder Pearson, brow beating doesn't work. 
love elder president Steve Lund. And that was it. There was no other lines. There was no other sentences. There was no welcome to the mission. There was nothing. So that was one. A second one was I was working closer with him at this point in time. And we had a weekly, a weekly meeting. Um, and I was late to it. Um, and I, I was late because I thought I was doing something that was better than being at his meeting. And he um, looked at me and he said, uh, Elder, do not be late to one of my meetings again. And that was that. Now, um, why was he able to be so stern with me and me accept it? There was so much trust and he had put so much into me. And there were so many interactions before that were positive and uplifting. And he would hit me with just making me feel like I was amazing. Um, that when he needed to teach me a lesson that, hey, when you make a commitment, especially with someone that you report to, you need to keep your commitment. And if you can't keep your commitment, you better communicate that. Yeah. You don't just show up late because you think you have something better to do. The principle of being on time, I could debate that. <laughs> but the principle of put enough into people so that when you need to be a bit more serious yeah. and they can take it well, that's also I mean, that's been me. your whole career, though. Like you, you see that all day, every day now where you have to go have hard conversations. Yeah. And you have to make hard decisions and you have to. And the only way that that ever goes anywhere but but bad is if you've made those deposits kind of a long time in advance from when that withdrawal has to come. Like I think about that concept of the emotional bank account and that, you know, we have them different with different people. And like if your account was withdrawn <laughs> with Steve, you're just going to feel like he's piling on right. in those moments. Though what, what's interesting is he really didn't have those deposits early in the mission. He didn't, he didn't even know you. No. So there's got to be something even more than like the deposits. There's got to just be like, I don't know. What I will say is one of my senior leaders that has been with me a long time gave me an interesting compliment. He said, Vess, you are the most elite person in the world at saying no. And I think what he was trying to say there is you, you can reset an expectation um, in a way that is positive that still feels uplifting and that still shows a really good path forward, but maybe reorient, reorients the person to more of a win-win for themselves, for yeah. the business and so on and so forth. I mean, that that's the good stuff right there. Like, keep going. Who, who else you got, you know, your uncle, you got Steve Lund who like, I, I, the reason I'm like, I want to go deep on this subject. This has been your life for 15 years. Like you, you're, you're working with kids that are 18 years old, 19 yeah. years old, 20. And you know, I, you know, I've got those people in my life that changed my life because they just believed in me more than I believed in myself. And, you know, I try to be that to other people, but like, go, who else is I, like on that short list of like this person, there was a pivotal moment. There was a crossroads and they were the person that God put in my life to, Help me become the man that I need to be. I mean, the name ringing in my ears is Angie, my spouse. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, there, there are points in my life where I, I wish I could uh, uh, cry, and I, I, I sometimes can't. Although it's happening more, I feel myself tearing up just saying her, her name. Um, Angie is an absolute light. Um, you know, I've. I have a fair amount of pressure, which, uh, and stress, which I actually think is a good thing. Uh, pressure and stress is an indicator that maybe you're doing things that matter. Yeah. It's an opportunity to make a difference. It sure is nice though, to go and, and be welcome home by a person that I know she feels stress and pressure, uh, but she doesn't show it. Uh, when our son was sick, very, very sick in primary children hospital, um, I would go to work and she had to stay at the hospital every day. And it was a scary time. Like our son was dying. 
He he was he had seven pick lines. He was in the pick you. There wasn't a guarantee that he was going to make it. And she would blow my mind every single day that I'd show up to the hospital. Somehow, some way, she had this this light and this aura and this positivity in what was a very dark moment for for me and the family that just lifted me up. And I believe it lifted up the nurses and the doctors. Um, When you're with her, there's just hope. And so uh, she's definitely a third, a third name for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which kind of stays on the same subjects. I mean, you guys got four kids. Um, balancing that, you know, not not shifting away from the topic, but balancing. How have you balanced family and work and God and? And like personal desires and hobbies and all those things, like like what's your like worldview and philosophy on that? Like how do you how do you make it all work? I could have never made it all work without Angie, because you you need a spouse um, that that can fill in the gaps that you can't fill, and she does that so instinctually and so perfectly. Um, for for me, uh, you're like God has to come first. Um, if God comes first, uh, then everything else can work out. I, I really, really believe that. Um, so I, I will say that God has to come first under all circumstances. I don't believe in balance whatsoever. Um, I think that it's, it is people going around searching for balance um, is, is a massive lie if they're seeking after happiness or if they're seeking after uh, greatness. Um, I believe in putting in time that match your virtues and that you as a human need to figure out what matters to you and to your family. And you fill up your time supporting those virtues. Uh, and I haven't always done that perfectly. If you're in law school or if you're in dental school, or if you're building active environmental and you are trying to put equal buckets of time into your family into church, into work, all that's going to happen is you are going to fail at all of those things. Um, So there's a time and a place. I probably believe in more of a balanced lifetime, that at certain points in your time, there's a season uh, that, that you put more time into certain things. So the reality is that luckily for me, I found a spouse that really, really supported the fact that I had massive ambitions professionally, that I wanted to go build one of the greatest service companies in the world, and that she was aware enough and business savvy enough to know what that takes. Um, And so she supported me in that. Now, one of the amazing things, though, for me is my my job as a chief executive officer is to build a team uh, and to to find people around me that that can support me and that that are better at marketing or operations or HR legal than I am. And so now that I have put in literally years of massive amounts of time, I'm now transitioning a little bit in my life where I can hand the baton a little bit more to my team. Yeah. And now I can go to Hayes's soccer practice anytime that I want to go. And Angie will say to me, hey, um, you're going to Hayes' practices a lot. Kind of like joking with me. And I'm like, yeah, I love it. Yeah. And by the way, maybe tomorrow he's not going to want to do soccer anymore. And I won't have that chance yeah. to do anymore. So now I'm putting more time into that. Um, when it comes to work-life balance, there has to be certain non-negotiables, though. Uh, and for me, uh, that's been, you know, God. Uh, in certain aspects. But what, what does that mean when you say non-negotiables with God? Like what, what meaning, does that equate to for you personally? Mean, meaning for me, like I'm going, I have a job with my congregation. There are certain responsibilities that um, it doesn't matter. I'm not. Because you're a young bishop. You yeah. got called as bishop when you're what? Uh, 36. 36. So real young bishop, you know, you're, you're kind of the leader of a local congregation. Yeah. On top of being a young dad, 
and trying to build like a super successful company, but a very uh, high maintenance. Yeah. You're, you're, when you scale the business that you're in, you're adding people. Yeah. And you're adding, you know, and so just more phone calls, more text messages, all those things. So I think it's like even pressing this question even more is how do you balance, if you will, or how do you prioritize the right energy to the right thing? And and when you're saying non-negotiable, like what does that entail? You know so, what I mean? Yeah. So, so, so for me, a non-negotiable is you're, you're going to, there, there's going to have to be something massive happening somewhere else in my life. If I'm going to miss one of my kids activities. Yeah. That's just, that's a value and a virtue to me that I'm just not going to miss Harper's dance recital. I'm just not going to miss one of my boys soccer games. Yep. It's just not going, um, to happen. Um, for, for, for our family, like we're, we are going to put our religious habits first. Like we're going to attend church on Sunday. Like that's just what we, that's what we do yep. as a family. Very few things are going to get in front of that. However, uh, I've been married, you know, coming up on 15 years. My oldest son is nine years or my oldest daughter is 11 years old. It is very rare that I've ever been home for dinner. You can read a, a, a million articles, a million books about how the best families, you know, they eat dinner together. Well, that's just not a value at our house. Yeah. We do other things, yep. you know, to, to make it up. And so I couldn't be home for dinner every single night and go and build Aptive and serve as a bishop and do humanitarian work that just wasn't going to work for our family. But I want to keep going. What are the non-negotiables? Like, what in your religion? What what what's go and no go? You know, what's the? Hey, this just happens for us. This just you know. You said we go to church every week. What what else kind of for the Pearsons is like? We do this. This is who we are. Yeah. So um, for for me, uh, faith and commitment um, is massive. If, if you don't have a guiding, uh, like a guidepost out there, which for our family is God and his son, um, it's really, really hard to, to, to sometimes keep the wheels, you know, on, on the bus. And so, you know, people specifically when it comes to faith, they sometimes will say, well, man, that's holding you back. You know, our religion, it's like, hey, there's all of these, there's all of these rules. The world will say, well, th those are things that are restrictive. No, our family, we embrace the rules. Yeah. The rules are an opportunity to show sacrifice, to show devotion, to show that we can put what's important to God in front of what's important, maybe uh, socially or to, to ourselves. And so I'm trying to instill that in my kids, because I, f I feel like if you can embrace standards and commitment and God, uh, you're going to just find success in other areas of your life. Yep. So having kind of that as a pillar, like stepping into like the personal non-negotiables, non like what are the non-negotiables with fitness for, for, for you? Like when you say, this is who I am, this is what so, I So, I mean, for... I don't know, like 10 years now on my calendar every single day is the gym at 8 a.m. I'm not like a lot of people that like they want to go and work out at 630. That's just not what I want to work yeah. out. I work out at eight. Um, it's on my calendar every single day. Uh, it never leaves my calendar. Every once in a while, I will choose to prioritize, you know, something above that. Uh, so I firmly believe that exercise is critical. Um, yeah, it, it helps your body to feel good, but for me, it gives you energy. Um, you know, it, mentally, if I don't work out, then I'm more mentally fatigued, and obviously, that's going to carry into the rest of the day. What time are you going to bed? I normally don't go to bed until probably uh, midnight, um, somewhere in there. I think some of that is. Uh, if I were to go to bed at like nine or 10 o'clock, 
I would have literally zero minutes in the day that were quiet <laughs> and that, that were just minor Angie's yeah. just because life is, life is busy. And so I think there's times where I'm like, yeah, maybe I'd go to bed a little earlier, but if I do that, then there's no kind of free time. Yep. So gym every day, bed by midnight. What are, what else on the physical thing is like, Hey, this is, this is what I do. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely check in with God every day. Uh, there, there's, there's prayer every day. Um, there's definitely some sort of a study every day. Uh, so, sometimes that study might be um, religious study, and sometimes that study, you know, might might be more academic in, in my the, field. In the morning, or just happens when it happens. It ha- for me, it happens when it happens. Um, I think that's the amazing thing about a phone is you literally have access to whatever information that you could ever want, just with a couple clicks in your hand at all times. Um, as, as addicted as we are to phones as human beings, I don't think we actually understand the, the power yeah. that we have as humans, that this device could, could be no, I, to I, go I, and lock I, your I, goals. I laugh at that stuff all the time. Like this is like 150 years ago. You had Abraham Lincoln, like walking three days to go get a book, <laughs> you know, and, and now you've got like every book that's ever existed on your phone and podcasts and audio books and the internet and chat GBT and like all of the tools and resources. And so, you know, you hear people kind of, yeah, complain about phones and how terrible they are, but like phones are just phones. Like they're, they're te- terrible or they're fantastic depending yeah. on how you where, where, yeah, where you're spending your time with them. But, but that's a super interesting point that you can kind of have it as you go. Um, talk, talk a little bit about the non-negotiables with work and with your profession. Like what are the things you just said? These are the things I do and these are the things I won't do. Generally speaking, and listen, as humans, we're not perfect at anything. Um, we're striving in a lot of things. And so as I say this, I don't want to give an illusion <laughs> that I have done this perfectly. Uh, I believe that in the early days, part of why I was able to be so tenacious and um, – successful is because when I spoke with somebody, I genuinely believed I was acting in their best interest. And I've tried to build a business, bringing people on where it's, it's in their best interest to be with me. And so a a non-negotiable professionally is I win, you lose. I'm, I'm, you just won't do it. I won't do it. Yeah. At least I won't do it in a premeditated yeah. fashion. It would be unfair, unsincere, and to, to say that that's never happened. Yeah. But what I can tell you is I've never met with someone and have me win and them lose. Um, if if I can keep on doing that, uh, we're going to continue to be uh, successful. An- another another non negotiable. Um, uh, for me, maybe this is, I don't know if you put this in the non, non-negotiable category, but uh, consistency over intensity. Uh, I, I show up every day, every single yep. day. Um, you know, Casey, you know, because your, your, your business is a little bit different than mine. It's, it's uh, you, you're, you're able to go and you're doing outings and trips and golf trips and, You've, you've built this amazing life where your main hobby is also your business. Yeah. Um, Casey has invited me time and time and time again. What am I about one out of 15 yeah. <laughs> um, that I can go? And it's, it's because I'm really, really consistent at showing up. I have felt like it's important for people uh, to see me. Yeah, you're not canceling. Like you're very, very rarely you like clearing the schedule and just cancel on people. You're, you're kind of showing up and you're, yeah, you're you, to to get something on the calendar. It needs to be premeditated, unless yes. it's silver leaf, and then you cancel. You know, if it's silver leaf, <laughs> the schedule gets cleared. Yes. Now, here here's where there's true greatness, though, that can happen. If you can have consistency and intensity, that's where you can really make magic happen. But that's kind of been your whole career. Like you're when you say you know consistency over intensity you've been intense for most of the ride. Like I can't think of like 
spots where you're kicking back and chilling. Like it's yeah. kind of been an intense sprint kind of from the get go. From yeah. When- well, and I think where that comes from, Casey, is that, as I said at the beginning, I wanted to be a professional athlete quickly realized that that just wasn't going to happen or I wasn't willing to put in the time to make it happen. So for me, business became a sport. And when business is a sport, it, it galvanized me. It, it helped me find the energy and the competitiveness to want to get out there day in um, and day out to, to go in and compete. And um, I mean, that's really how you and I kind of got to know each other. With, oh, with and, and honestly, where a lot of the respect level came. I mean, we, we were direct competitors and my partner, Bodie Gardner um, and Scott Bell, they were <laughs> relentless. There was this window in time where they were just trying to take anybody that worked for Aptive. And literally, they, uh, we kind of threw every resource that we could throw at Aptive. And we just didn't have a whole lot of success. We, we would get people to come work with us. And then Vess would go meet with them at 2 in the morning, and they'd <laughs> be working with him again. And we just kind of like exhausted a lot of time and resources to not have a whole lot of substance. And I think one of the, one of the takeaways was like, when you, when you go play a game and you play somebody really good and you kind of like tip your hat at the end, you're like, Hey, well played, (laughs) you know, that, and that was kind of my first time where I I was like, Hey, Bess is real and he's going to build a great company. Because I just knew that you wouldn't quit. And, and I've kind of seen that ethos kind of permeate through the group, you know, as, as goes the leader, as goes the team. And you've kind of attracted that type of person that works in your company, which I've always really admired, you know. And so, yeah, just calling that out as like culture happens by design or by default. And I don't know if you plan that or if you said, hey, this is who we are and you've talked to people about it, but definitely by actions – Everybody kind of sees when the boss is working till 2 a.m. Everybody else works till 2 a.m. And, and my experience coming up through Vivint was that. When, when I got recruited to Vivint, um, we had actually chosen to go work with somebody else. And got a call from Todd Peterson and Alex Dunn. And me and my wife and those two met with Alex and Todd and Todd's wife till daylight, till 7 a.m., Amazing. And that was my first experience with the company. And so as like a young leader, it's like, well, that's what you do. You go all night. You do whatever it takes to get the job done. You don't stop until the job's done because that was what was modeled for me. And it changed my career, like for for the whole space of my career. And so anyway, what you're doing is a gift to the people that are working for you because it models, you know, you do, you don't stop when you're tired. You stop when the job's finished. Well, and I, I, I think that something that, you know, I, I learned in books or, or watching people like Kobe Bryant's is that the sooner that you can really enjoy and find joy in all of the hard and not be obsessed with the outcome. Yeah. You don't, all of those years grinding didn't necessarily fe- feel like work to me. Yeah. I was playing my sport <laughs> and it was it was fun. I I enjoyed the problem solving. I enjoyed, hey, can can I beat Bodie, Casey and Todd Peterson one on three? Can I just beat them by myself? Like that 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 was fun uh to me and I think that a lot of times people get so fixated on on where on the destination and that final outcome that man they they miss out on all of the learning and all of the fun trying to get there yeah. so talk talk to me to me about people that inspire you when when you're when you're sitting around and you're thinking about hey this is somebody that lights me up when i you you mentioned kobe but like different people in your life that you you say that person inspires me and for what reasons so i i love um I love Abraham Lincoln for for one major uh, reason. Um, He was an incredible listener. Uh, He he was um, the most, you know, at the time, you know, well, uh, yeah, when he he was doing his thing, he was probably the most important figure in the world. (laughs) 
Um, and he's known for listening. Here, here you have uh, the Union, you know, and the Confederacy, and you know, slavery is just a part of life at the time. Um, and somehow he listened and listened and listened and picked his spots to where he completely changed the course of our nation and completely changed a way of life. And he did it without having to open up his mouth a ton. And so I've always uh, loved him. Another one is, is Gordon Hinckley. Um, what I love about Gordon Hinckley is a lot of what I love about Angie is positivity, uh, lemons to lemonade, Yo. Um, you, his humor and his wit. And he had a lightness about him. Um, I, I remember that in a 60 Minutes interview a long time ago, the reporter was trying to point out all of these things that, that, that she thought or he thought um, we're going to be like negative. <laughs> yeah. And his response with a smile was, yeah, isn't it great? <laughs> and the reporter was like, kind of taken back. Like, what do you mean? But he, he, he flipped that question. I mean, he, 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 he was that leader for me too. I remember being kind of fresh off a mission and he was kind of the leader of the LDS church at the time. And he was just like, kind of to this day, he's probably my favorite. I mean, he, Yes, you know, he was just a special leader for a lot of reasons. You know, I, I remember hearing the stories of him and his wife and his wife was just really independent, you know, kind of fiery and just hearing kind of the stories of how they raised their kids and how they were independent of each other. Like how she uh, I remember her saying, you know, he gave me wings and it was, you know, always meant the world to me, but always supporting each other's dreams, you know? And so uh, that's interesting. You bring that one up. I haven't thought about Gordon B. Hinckley in a long time, but he was kind of that person for me. That's like, yeah, you know, he inspired to this day, you know, is a, a light and inspires me. So that one's cool. And then who else you got on that list? I mean, I mentioned Kobe. I'll, I'll tell you my favorite Kobe story. Um, it's when, uh, late Lakers are struggling um, he doesn't have a, he, you know, doesn't really have a sidekick kind of towards the end of his career. Uh, they're battling to get into the playoffs late season playoff run. They're probably going to make it, um, really important game that matters. He goes and makes a really simple cut and age gets him and he tears Pops. his Achilles. Yeah. Yep. And there's just a lot that happened there that I'm like, wow, this is special. Number one, irrationally. But, but sometimes it really helps us as humans to be irrational and to, to believe that we can do things that might not make sense yeah. to others, even if it's not possible. Irrationally, he's messing with his calf, and you can go watch the video. He's wondering if he can somehow pull his Achilles down and, like, I don't know, maybe he's going to, like, tie so. a knot, <laughs> reattach it real quick. Like, that, that was his yeah. first thought. Obviously not possible. So then I've seen two or three people tear their Achilles playing basketball and they scream in pain. Like it's a really painful injury. What does Kobe do? Uh, well, he gets fouled on the play. It's a close game. So somehow on his own power, he steps up to the free throw line and makes both free throws. Doesn't have someone else take them. Like he's taking these free throws because this game really matters. And then the, the last thing is um, he walks off the court on his own. Uh, the, the irrationality, the willingness to go step up and make the free throws because his team needs it. Then just the toughness to, to be willing to just go and, and walk off on his own. And, yeah. then, and then after the game, it was very much, this happened. I'm sad. He's crying. Um, and he says, it's time to get to work. Yeah, I've, I've got a job to do. Yeah. I, I got I to come back from this. His kids were there. He wanted to be tough, you know, for his kids. And yeah, Kobe was never the same player. And that's okay. Uh, because the lesson for him was, hey, yeah, I might not be the same player that I was before, but can I be the greatest player 
that's come back from an Yo. Achilles in- injury at my age. And so th- those are a few names. Well, well when you talk about like inspiration, for me, like the people, and maybe it's, you know, I don't think there is like a traditional path. I think we all have our own path. But I think about my path and it's like I dropped out of college and I'm a door to door salesman. Yeah. And I'm, you know, got super lucky, worked for the right company and it ended up being like this great outcome. But there's always kind of the, you know, imposter syndrome or these insecurities of, oh, I needed like this path to be able to go be successful. And I look at, you know, the people that inspire me are honestly, a lot of them are athletes. It's the Steve Youngs, it's the Kobe Bryants, it's the Shaquille O'Neal's, it's the Magic Johnson's, it's the people that were specialists and they were world-class in like their protect, their particular specialty. But then they take like those skills and they take those fundamentals and the same traits that made them so great in this and they apply them kind of to the field of business and end up being like equally as excellent in the field of business. And that's the one that, you know, when I think about Kobe, I'm like, I wonder what he would have done in that business world because he was, he was right. I mean, he was just getting started. Well, he, I mean, building that empire shortly after his retiring, he won an Oscar basketball player. I'm going to go win an Oscar. Yeah. Then after that, he made a few hundred million dollars as a businessman when body armor yep. was sold. And he's just that, yeah, that perfect example of reinventing yourself and, and being able to channel your energy in, into new projects yep. and new passions, you know, as, as life carries on. Yeah. I, I'm kind of, I've been kind of obsessed with this concept over the last three or four years of identity and how we see ourselves and like, you know, changing identity. But when, when you're describing Vess Pearson, I am this, how would you, how would you describe? I am, you know what I mean? Like what, what, what are, what, what's kind of the, the way that you would say, this is who I am. This is my identity. This is just like what I was put on this earth to be. Man. I am striving. And I'm striving in a lot of areas. Um, I don't feel uh, like I've arrived in to, you know, to, to on any of them. Which um, is so like, cause from the outside looking in, people would say your, your ship has come in, you know, you made millions of dollars. You CEO of a really successful company. You got a great family. You're, you know, leader in your community build a big house, like that you've arrived, you know what I mean? What, what, how do you reconcile that with striving? You know what I mean? Because I feel like one of the reasons why we're put on the earth is to try to see if we can shorten up the gap between where we are right now and where our potential is. And for me, what makes life fun is always believing that there's something more Yeah, that, that, there's another, there's another level. And yeah, like I've done a nice job as a business person. Uh, there's a lot of work I have to do though, as a philanthropist, I've done, you know, an, an okay job as a friend. But, but even like going back to that business thing, like this is just from an outsider looking in, like I've watched you be a really great sales leader. And then I've watched you be a really great founder. And I've told you this a bunch of times, like you're becoming like a really phenomenal executive, senior executive. And those aren't the same thing. They're very, very different right. roles. And I've seen you get coaches, like literally hire coaches to come like pick apart your blind spots. Like would that tie back to the striving? Would that come back back to like this? Like I want to become the best that I can become. Yeah. I mean, how do you keep on living if you feel like you've arrived? Like how, like what, what gets you up? What lights you up? If Yo. everywhere you turn, you're thinking, yeah, I've done that. I've arrived. I'm Yo. the best. Like you're right. I, I hired a CEO coach. Um, and it's the best thing I've done professionally, uh, early on though. And this is after Aptive has been successful and I've been successful. I go home and I said to Angie, 
um, I think I might be the worst executive in the world. And I said it with sincerity because my coach had beat me up so hard. Um, and he's beating you up over what? Like, where, where is he saying like, Hey, you're, <clears throat> you're screwing this up. Like you're, you're not the, the way, the, the way that my, the, the way that I formed my team, who's, who's on my team, the, the way that I speak, not being definitive enough. I, I say, I say being too nice, but what I will, it, it's not that you're ever too nice per se, but you don't communicate clearly. And you're afraid sometimes to do the hard, yeah. to do the hard things. And, and justifying it as being nice. Yes. Yeah. Being put up against the wall, that, that level of desperation and that level of pressure, you're either going to step up and learn and do what it takes, or you're going to crumble. And luckily I, I had the gumption to step up, learn and do what it takes. People don't understand that I was feeling so much pressure and I had so much anxiety. I was going to my doctor regularly because I thought I was going to have a heart attack legitimately. I felt that much, that much weight. Um, but I got my coach. We started uh, to be very, very deliberate. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Um, and, and kind of if I had a superpower, Casey, it would be that I am incredibly willing to, to be conscientious. And what is conscientiousness? Conscientiousness is sitting in the front. It's showing up. It's turning your assignment in on time. It's precision with following instructions. It's being willing to ask a question when you don't know. And it's being willing to do it over a really long period of time. There is very little um, massive intelligence required for greatness. If you can just be super conscientious, you can be marginally smart like me <laughs> and dig yourself out of a hole Yo. and get to a, a much higher place. Um, go through those changes. So th those changes, uh, for, first and foremost, as, as your business grows, you have to get out of, um, so sometimes you, you just have to make changes with people that were with you from the beginning. They're still really great people, but they just haven't seen it at this level. Yeah. And so I had to make a, a, a few critical changes on my executive team. He hires. I needed to find people that had seen business at a, at the level that I was, that I was wanting to go. So I went and I now have executives on my team that have all seen it at the billion dollar level. How hard is that though? Like to <laughs> like continue to level up the team that you're playing with? Well, it, it's, it's very hard. I searched for my executive team ever since 2021. I made my final hire four months ago. Yeah. And so to, to find these types of people um, is really, really hard. And by the way, you do have to have a good business to attract them. For sure. I um, mean, I, I'm thinking about my personal experience and, you know, I worked with Vivint, you know, it was Apex and they took their first money from Goldman and then they went through kind of a formal process and they sold to Blackstone. It was a $2 billion transaction. And I'd kind of been with them, you know, that was where I got educated on business was going through the yeah. working in the business and we, at that point, we were, we were the senior team, you know, we were the guys that Todd and Alex talked to when there was decisions. And I still remember it was so, it, it was so hard for me and, uh, you know, the guys I worked with to, for Todd and Alex to make the decision to hire senior people in these different roles. They hired, you know, Todd Santiago and David Bywater and Scott Hardy and, um, Sean Linquist and, you know, yes. put, put a, you know, really phenomenal team together. Well, and, and it, if, uh, Matt Iring, you know, like a, a phenomenal team, but it was really hard medicine working in the business to say, Hey, I don't have that same access to these guys who were, you know, like the reason that I'm at this business and who are these outside guys yeah. that, you know, think they know everything. And you, you know, as you kind of get some reps and you look back, you're like, that had to happen. Like that's the, like Vivint never would have gone to where they needed to go without leveling up on their leadership team, 
but culturally it was hard. And like, I'm sure you felt that internal where it's like, I know this is where I need to go, but this is really lonely. It, it's gut wrenching Yeah, because none of us ever want to disappoint people, but we always have to be honest with people. Being honest or letting someone believe something that just isn't true um, is never helpful. So if, if we find ourselves in a position where someone is being hired over us, we have a couple of choices. We can look at it as, oh man, they, they betrayed me. They haven't been loyal to me. Why don't they see something in me? Or you can look at it as this is a massive opportunity for me to learn from someone someone that's been there and done that. And luckily for me, as hard as some of those conversations were, some of those people will probably listen to this podcast. I think that they will all look back and say, should have done it sooner. Those were the yes. right moves. Those were the right moves. The other amazing thing that, the other things that we had to do, I actually learned from the process. The, the greatest thing that's happened to me professionally was I failed in 2021 at selling my business. And because I failed, I learned a lot. I learned, hey, revenue is important. You got to grow, but you're not a real business if you don't drive EBITDA. So what are the levers that you need to start pulling to drive better EBITDA? Okay, you need to have better customer retention and lower uh, customer churn. You need to have better pricing. Uh, your COGS has been going down. Can you get your COGS back up to over to 70%? How can you leverage technology to be more efficient? How can you lower your CAC, your cost of acquiring customers? These are all, uh, it's all terminology and things that had I not gone through that you, process. You, you, don't, you don't know this when you're a sales rep. You don't know, you this, have no when, idea. You don't know this when you're a founder. And I, I think that's like, like just looking at it from the outside, looking in, I was like, that process can go one of two ways. Even if you save it, yeah, you kind of go right back to the things that you were doing and go make the exact same mistakes. And I, I think like what was so impressive, you know, the, the reason I've, I've said this to you a couple of times, like you're becoming a phenomenal executive is to actually notice, to pay attention, to say, I've got some of the smartest people in the world, like very smart people, and they're all pinging me on the same thing. They're yeah. beating me up on my, yes. my, my customer acquisition cost. They're beating me up on my net retention. They're beating me up on, you know, how much I charge customers. They're beating me up on my cogs. Like my, and, my, and it's my consistent. L it's consistent. You know, my LTV to CAC ratio is off yeah. before it's like, what in the world is, what you can, in the world is that? You kind of go into them saying, <laughs> you don't understand my business. And then you get to the end of it and say, yeah. maybe I don't understand my business. And that's, it, that's hard. Exactly. And, and so back to your original question um, about my coach, I was a really good learner through this failure and we just started solving problems. Um, okay. Well, what do we, what do we gotta do with pricing? What do we need to do with acquisition costs? Hey, we're, you know, we're your G and a, you're not very efficient there. The ROI is not coming the way it needs to come from this area. What are you going to do about it? And a, and a lot of our coaching sessions were how to be definitive and how to communicate these things. These changes. But what I, I cannot go back to this enough. If I didn't have my executive team, if I didn't make these hires, and by the way, I had some of these hires already. I just needed to round it out. Um, I, I couldn't have achieved the success that we've achieved. Yeah. Um, so you grow it like a rocket and it wasn't the first time, you know, that you guys had built a company and sold it. I mean, Dave had done that three times before, yeah, multiple times. And, you know, that's a kind of different story in and of itself is like how you guys build Altera mistakes you made, you know, positive outcomes, what you learned, how you applied that and, you know, a whole different conversation. But you go through, you build it to a point where you you think I'm going to go sell this for a billion dollars. Like this is it. You know, you're in New York right. meeting with money managers. I think I'm rich. <laughs> drawing, up the, <laughs> drawing up the house plans <laughs> to like, hey, we're on the like, I, th this is a scary situation. Like you wouldn't have gone bankrupt, but no. it, but it would have hurt. 
Like you would have delayed back ends. You would have had to sell some accounts. You would have had to like make some changes that would have hurt the business. You know what I mean? Exactly. And then you go to implement these changes where now I, I look at you guys and you're just like humming. Like the, you, you have this momentum yeah, in now, the market, you know, and you, you have a bigger, a bigger vision than just go out and sell pest control door to door. Yeah. I mean, now, now, now the conversations turn to it, which is awesome. How do we, how do we bundle? How do we make it? So every time that we show up to a home, we're collecting more dollars and providing more value to our customers. Do we add mosquito? Do we add termite? Do we add lawn care? Now, now we can begin talking about M and a, uh, which company should we buying? Should we, should we jump into commercial? Should we jump into termite? Should we start buying, you know, re- regional players? And when you have really smart people around you, you, you learn the power of debt and leverage and amortizing deals. So for example, if I go buy a pest control company, the cash is going out immediately, but from a PL standpoint, I'm amortizing that cost over five years. Yep. So here I am buying a $50 million company um, and EBITDA and revenue are going up in that same year. And th- just these, because of how it has to be accounted for. Because of the accounting. So which, it's just part of it's learning the game, you know, exactly. like the, the game of business and the game of tax and the game of accounting and then like kind of. But yes. most of that's like when you go through a process, you get taught. <laughs> you yes. get taught because people people vote with their pay, with their paycheck. Exactly. You know what I mean? They with their checkbook. And if they're not writing a check, they're saying, There's a piece of your business I'm not buying. You yeah. know, and Yeah. And and so for anyone for anyone listening, I guess whether or not you're starting a business or or you're not, you're 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 struggling with something else is cliche as it sounds. Um, I just want to put an exclamation point on the fact that there is so much to be gained when you fail. My greatest failure is going to lead professionally to my greatest triumph. Yeah. And that triumph would have never, ever come had I not gone through those really dark days where once again, I thought I was going to have a literal heart attack dying dying uh so alex dunn is kind of you know when you talk about like the mentors or like the people that are top of top for you he's one of those guys that kind of believed in me more than i ever believed in myself at a at a point in life where i could have made a hundred different decisions um but he has this quote that i always think about and it kind of goes to what you're describing is The only way to like the way to learn how to be an entrepreneur is to be an entrepreneur. (laughs) Exactly. The the real way to like learn isn't to go study in a book or take a class. It's to start a business. Yes. And that's where you like, if you can't pay payroll, that's where you, it gets real. You know, the test gets real Well, and it's in degrees. It's like from the smallest level to I need $120 million, you know. The way you learn is you learn. <laughs> yes. Entrepreneurship is amazing because the, the formula is actually really, really simple. Just be willing to problem solve. If you have endurance problem solving, you will make it as an entrepreneur. There is a solution out there. Sometimes that solution is to stop doing what you're doing and do something else. But that is a solution in and of itself. And so no one needs to feel intimidated if they have the desire to go and start something. As long as they have the gumption to solve problems consistently, you'll make it. The problem is uh, a lot of people, they'll solve one problem or two or three. You got to be willing to solve an infinite number. I'm solving problems every day. (laughs) Still, that's what makes it really fun though. Talk about active five years from now. When, when, When... You look at where you started, where you're at, and where you're going. What does Aptive look like five years from I now? I mean, Aptive is going to be really big. It's going to be very profitable. Uh, it is very profitable. But that's not actually what gets me excited. Uh, Aptive is going to be world-class when it comes to customer service. And we're going to be world-class when it comes to employee experience. We're going to be neighborly. We're going to give back to the community. And, the, and, and at least the nation is going to know about it. Um, we're building our muscle 
right now when it comes to understanding the heart of the customer. We're building our, our muscle right now as we learn to tie being super profitable and helping people understand that that's what's going to allow for a better career and a better employee experience. We're not there, but that's where we know we're going to, to head. The, 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 the dollar side of it for me is a foregone conclusion. We've now proven we know how to do services and, and turn it into EBITDA. Yeah. What's really getting me excited is I believe there's a path where Aptiv can be viewed from a customer care standpoint, the way that Costco is viewed, the way that Nordstrom is viewed, the way that Ritz Carlton is viewed, the way that Chick-fil-A is viewed. And what my team is now spending all of their energy around is it's one thing to have a heart for customer service. It's another thing to operationalize customer service. It's not good enough to just say, I want to take care of my people. But, it, or but my it, customers. it has to start from the top, though. Like like yeah. all of those companies that you're referring to, like I, I think of Amon, I think of, you know, Porsche, I think of yes. Lululemon, I think of like these c- companies that just embody excellence. Yes. And specifically around service, companies that have phenomenal service have a fanatical leader about service. Like it's just that is the – Like it starts, you have to institutionalize it, operationalize it, but really you have to be that you can't fake service. You can't service is an attitude. You know what I mean? It's that's exactly right. And and admittedly the first five or six years, we were a sales company that did pest control. Now we are a service company uh, that is also really, really good in sales. Our hearts are in the right spot. We're, we're screaming from the rooftops on who we want to be. And I've got the team though, that is actually operationalizing how we're going to do it in theory. For example, one of my executives um, said, hey, I went to the Ritz-Carlton in India five years ago. When he showed up again for a business trip, guess what they had waiting for him? The same exact type of cigar that they knew that he liked (laughs) from five years ago. When I went to a really cool golf course a few months ago, um, I told him, yeah, I like to practice with Pro V1s. When I showed up, somehow they had a process and a procedure that they had Pro V1s as my practice balls when I got there again. No, it's it's that type of stuff. Like, it fires me up so much. Like, I, I am a service junkie. I pay a premium Yep. For service every time. Like I admire companies because it, it really does come down to attitude and caring and conscientiousness. It, it, it's not a cost thing most of the time. It's incre- incrementally more money. Yep. It's more about I, I care enough to take those extra notes and to ask the question and to think, hey, what would make this really special? You know, every trip's fun, but like, this would make it a step beyond and this would make it a step and then incentivizing it. I mean, it's just that, that that's kind of a different case in of itself in of itself is just how, how do you build world-class service organizations? And and they just demand a premium in the market. Like people pay for phenomenal service. They, 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 there's a, you, every, every hotel you stay at has a disproportionate premium if they have world class service, they, they could they can just charge more. And then and then the la- the last thing uh, you know as far as where Apt is going to be is we're a service company, but I actually see us as a tech company. Um, we so, are so di- so dig into that because I think somebody on the outside would look and say, "How are you a tech company? You're showing up somebody's house. You're you're yeah. spraying bugs. You're spraying mosquitoes. You're like how I I love that. Um, well. And a lot of reasons. N- num- number one, from a data standpoint, Aptiv is now at a point where we have scored homes, all 50 million homes in America. We know which homes are going to have the greatest lifetime value, which ones have the greatest propensity to churn, which ones have the greatest propensity to not churn. And we are knocking those homes. We developed software, it's called Aero, uh, that optimizes routes, that helps us to know the most efficient way that we should do the 15,000 stops. It's completely in-house. It even, it, well, it doesn't yet, but it will take into account things like lot size, 
home size. Yeah. How much time were we at the house uh, previously? We've developed a field service app um, that nobody else has that allows us to better capture customer preferences um, and, and makes the experience with the service pro to the customer, you know, that much better. Uh, the flexibility that we have, that we have with our sales apps that I can, in a, you know, just that quickly change the type of plan that we are offering uh, to better serve our sales reps, the way that we're gamifying the sales experience, the way that we're routing calls inside of our call center to c- connect the correct call to the correct customer account manager to give that customer the best uh, experience possible. The yeah. way that we're predicting who is going to cancel and when they're going to cancel and what we're going to do up front in order to stop that cancellation. And so I, I could go on and on yeah, and on. Yeah, yeah. And this is another area where we're scratching the surface, but it makes me but, excited. But, but, but I think this specifically, when I think about your industry, is what would make Aptive different than everybody else. Exactly. Is it's an extremely archaic industry. Yes. And it's actually a very profitable industry, which allows it to stay archaic. Yes. Because you kind of don't actually need to change it that and much. And the, the need is massive. Yep. The and need so is, it's sleepy. Yep. It's um, sleepy. Okay. Uh, this is going to be the last question, then we'll finish up. Um, I know giving is something that's like really important to you. And you reference back to Steve Lunn and kind of that model of generosity and kind of learning that. Um, you recently gave a $3 million gift to primary children's hospital. Um, talk a little bit about giving, talk a little bit about philanthropy and kind of the next 50 years of the Pearson family and like what that's about, you know, why that's, important today, why primary children's, why that, you know, kind of talk about how that fits into your life and kind of the whole picture of who you are and kind of who your family is. Yeah. You know, once again, we're striving, right? And so I always hesitate to come on a podcast because I, I, I want people to understand that although, um, there might be this appearance of, of so much success and there has been great success. Um, I'm striving and I don't feel like I've arrived in any area. Uh, but one of the core things I told you at the beginning is as a Pearson, uh, we love God and we love his son. Um, and we're never going to shy away from that. Um, we're never going to Despite our success, forget about that, no matter what the consequence. Um, therefore, because I have been given much, I too must give. Um, we want to live by that. Angie wants to live that way. I want to live that way. And my kids are beginning to live that way. The amazing thing about giving is that if you will give, you always are given more in return. Arthur Brooks wrote the greatest talk on giving I've ever read, Why Giving Matters. And he, he is an economist. And he teaches that <clears throat> whether or not you believe it is God that is rewarding you for giving, or whether or not you believe life is better because when you give, you are seen as a better leader, um, you are healthier, you are happier, you are less depressed— It has been proven with science and with economics that if you give, you will be wealthier. That is not why I give, but I have seen abundance in my life, in my my relationships, in my happiness, in the way that others view me, the way that others view my family, because we give. And I I need to give credit... um, to somebody because I was not naturally thinking about giving a decade ago. Um, It was actually my brother, Drew, that really started to talk to me about giving. And Vess, we got to do it at the time. We got to do it at Altera. We got to do it at Aptiv. I promise you, Vess, you're going to love it. You're going to, you're going to see the value of it. And he really got me started on the path. Uh, so great. 
um, why primary promise? You can give anywhere, and you do give, you, you know, give back in Aptiv. You guys do charity trips. You give to your church, you know, yeah. you, in the community. But, like, a big gift to local hospital. I know it's personal for you. Yeah. You know, people uh, read about angels. It's like, well, where where are they? You know, are they are they real? Um, and for me, I've learned that they're real. In our our angel, his name was Dr. Fenton, who in the middle of the night took our son who was dying and saved his life and has been with us now for nine years as we've now done hundreds of surgeries, uh, continuing to repair Hayes' body. Um, and how, how could you not want to give back to the organization that provided a literal angel for your family. That is the way that we see him. And so it was a long time ago um, that Angie said, when we are able, we want to meaningfully give to primary children's. And here's the really, really interesting thing. Um, Going back to Steve Lund, he had been talking to me about primary children's before I even knew primary children existed because he had a son who was given the most amazing care, who eventually died of cancer, but through primary children. And then it's just awesome how the world works because Casey, you're a golfer. I, I said to Casey, hey, I know that Silverleaf has like a member guest tournament. You should go. And honestly, when I said that, I was not saying like, hey, like I should go. I was saying you should go. But Casey invited me, and and for four days, we got to hang out, and I treasure those four days. Um, And this is where Casey started talking to me about this conference and how Primary Promise was going to be involved, and it all just worked out. Um, And and it's you, Casey, that were really the facilitator for Angie and I to uh, provide that gift. No, it's so special because I think about, like, the facilitators for me— and how like it's just this virtuous cycle and how kind of you were that for we do this conference and best gets up in front of 1500 people and kind of leads out on the experience that they'd had and kind of what they were doing. And since then, I think we're pushing up to close to $10 million from that um, awesome. experience, you know, and, and I think it just keeps going. I think, you know, I, I run into people all the time um, that are really successful like extremely successful, massive exits. Um, there's one individual that I'm thinking about that he came to me and he, and he just said, I fully funded my DAF and it's sitting in a checking account and I can't give away a dollar. And there's this scarcity and there's this kind of like fear of letting go and, and putting it out there. And it was kind of, it was a knot in his heart. And he said, I, I don't want that. I want to be able to, to give, but I can't like, and it's, you know, whether you're raised a certain way or you, you just grew up in it. And I think, you know, that's always something that I've admired about you is kind of generosity and you, and you see it kind of, you see it not just in money, but in time and listening and kind of the conscientiousness. I think service is charity. I think, you know, providing good service is like a, it's an attitude and it's a, the spiritual game, you know, like you really have to care about people to provide good service. Well, and let me just make the point, too, that oftentimes the person that writes the check is seen as the better giver. That's just what society does. Um, that is not the case. Uh, though you, giving, giving your time, giving your ears, giving your heart, <laughs> um, those are every bit as valuable. And um, so that's why I feel bashful about, yeah, we we have been blessed in a way that allow a a large gift. My large gift, uh, excuse me, our large gift is not greater than the neighbor that I've had, that my grandpa's had for 20 years (laughs) that has served him day in and day out. Yeah. And I I think that um, I don't, I want people to hear this and just, just start giving and not think, well, because I'm at 50, I might as well not do anything because Vess was at three. Yeah. Like, 
No, just just start, um, and uh, it'll it'll bless you. So I'm tremendously. thinking about I'm thinking about that conference again. And Gail Miller, she gets up and she's talking about wealth and she's talking about Larry, and she's her definition of wealth, and it came from Larry H. Miller, and he said, you know, true wealth is what you have if you lost everything. <laughs> and the way he described it was, if I lost everything, I'd have a lot of great friends. And I'd go start selling apples, and I'd be the best apple salesman that ever lived. And it's kind of like I've got the skill set, I've got my health, I've got my hustle, I've got my relationships, and that's really, you know, what you have. The the, the money is a byproduct of value creation. Yes. And over time, like the the money's a scorecard. Yes. Um, I was gonna finish up, but I, I want to take a moment to talk about this because it ties into everything. So we we were talking before. Um, about an experience you had in the last 24 hours. Yeah. And, and I, th- I think it'd be like a miss if we didn't talk to it because there's some gems in there that I think are like all the good stuff in life. So may- maybe talk a little bit about um, the last 24 hours. I know it's been <laughs> like a, a, a crisis in the, the Pearson family over the last 24 hours. But again, going to the place where you hit kind of rock bottom, sometimes the the best gifts in life come from the lows. Man, I, I was actually, I, I told you at the beginning, I'm not a crier because I'm, I'm not a generally, but on the way here, I was in my car alone crying because, um, and then I was worried like, ah, oh, Casey's going to like, he's going to see my eyes red. And, and then I walked in and there's five or six of us in here and we kind of had a little cry session. <laughs> Uh, together, which what great people you have working with you that they, they let me tell this story and, and kind of have a little bit of therapy. But we've had a dog for 14 years um, and her name is Joey and she's been the best dog. Um, Angie and I bought her five months into our marriage because I was traveling so much and she just wanted a companion. Um, so we bought this dog. Well, she's gotten older, but she's actually in perfect health that said, you have the most healthy 14-year-old dog that has ever lived, and, but, she, but she's hard of hearing. Well, yesterday, I race home from work. I'm grabbing Hayes. He has a so- uh, soccer practice up in Salt Lake. We're in a hurry. I jump in my truck, um, and for whatever reason, Joey's underneath my truck, and I don't know it, and I run her over. Um, I, I, I feel it. My neighbor calls me because my neighbor's driving by, seeing what's happening, and goes, did Joey make it? And I immediately knew what had happened. Pull around the corner, and there's our, uh, our dog. And um, Hayes 9 is, is crying, and I, I go, and you know I have to pick her body up. And, and then the, all the rest of the family comes home, and we have this moment of, Angie, me, kids, we're, we're crying. We're sad. Um, but my, my son, Hayes, about an hour later, after all of this happens, somehow just has the wherewithal to write me a note. Um, because I think I'm probably taking the death of Joey a little bit worse than everyone else because I was the one that ran her over. I couldn't see her. Um, but I still did it. And you, obviously your mind goes towards, you know, you should have checked and you, why didn't it, why, why didn't you realize, you know, where she was? This is within one hour though. Dear dad, uh, I know you felt really bad that you killed Joey. So I'd like to write you a little note. Dad, I will always love you no matter what happens. I also know that mom, harp, Beck and Jack will always love you. Uh, I know that you a lot have done. I know that you have done a lot of really amazing things in your life, and Joey is now in heaven. I know she has the best life up there. We love you. Love your sons, Hayes. And then, in typical Hayes fashion, he let his little brother Beckett uh, sign the card as well. Um, I read this earlier, and uh, you know, broke down and broke down in tears. Um, maybe Joey passed so that I could have that gift from Hayes. Um, 
what's better than having your child or anyone tell you that I love you no matter what? Um, You know, we've talked a lot about wealth and giving and business success and EBITDA. Um, And once again, as raw as it still is, one of my greatest gifts is coming from one of my greatest tragedies. Losing Joey uh, gave me a family artifact (laughs) that I have uh, forever. And trust me, I'm searching for the ways to figure out why this was a good thing. Uh, Hayes gave me a nice start to trying to figure that out. Uh, So cool. Brother, appreciate you coming out. So fun. Sure, we'll do it again. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much, Casey. 